Hi everybody, my name is Teresa Carpenter and uh, I don't do these videos a lot, uh, but when there's an issue uh, concerning animals, uh, it compels me to want to say something and to speak out. And with so many people online who have been talking about the uh, Netflix documentary Tiger King, um, I too uh, was very curious about the documentary and decided to give it a watch. And after watching it, I too got sucked into the sensationalism of it all and didn't know what to think, quite frankly. I'd never heard of Big Cat Rescue. I didn't know a lot about the exotic animal issue. And uh, I just thought it was an entertaining documentary, but didn't know what to believe. So I decided to dig a little bit deeper and into the big cat and exotic animal issue. And as I did that, um, I came across an old friend of mine from back when I did a lot of volunteer work with the Humane Society of the United States. And she had some firsthand experiences about the exotic animal industry and uh, shared a couple posts on Facebook, one last weekend and then another one uh, today. And as she will tell you, they were the most shared and commented on postings that she's ever done. And uh, I wanted to give Kathy a little bit a chance to talk about her work in that arena. Uh, it's, some, it's very fascinating. It's firsthand work on the front lines doing animal advocacy on the policy side, um, which is very, very important to have people doing this type of work. So thank you, Kathy, for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, I just want to start off with some uh, just basic questions and sort of what your role was. How, how did you get involved in the issue of the private ownership of, of I, I don't know if I want to say exotic animals or wild animals. How did you get involved in that? Um, so it kind of started back in 2010 um, when the Humane Society um, ran a farm animal welfare campaign in Ohio and they wanted to put an issue on the ballot for farm animals to be able to stand up, turn around and spread their limbs. And the Ohio Farm Bureau was fighting that tooth and nail. Um, and so I got involved with the HSUS from that, just trying to get signatures on that campaign. And the HSUS did not end up taking that all the way to the ballot. Instead, what they did was they came to an agreement with the Farm Bureau to start a farm animal welfare review board that would look at farm animal welfare in the state. But they also, key to that agreement was that the Farm Bureau would stop aligning with um, dangerous wild animal owners in Ohio and also with um, people who had ran large commercial pup like dog breeding operations, AKA puppy mills. Mm -hmm. So previously the farm, the farm Bureau had been a co-sponsor of, for example, the Mount Hope exotic animal auction where a lot of um, wild animals of all sorts were taken and auctioned and were kept in humane conditions and were sold to God knows who. And the Farm Bureau was a co-sponsor of that and they withdrew wow. their sponsorship. And so a lot of the reasons, so Ohio at that time, was just a hotbed. It had no laws about exotic animal ownership, and it was a hotbed for breeders and dealers in dangerous wild animals. So a lot of people don't know that the wild animal trade is right up there with um, gun running, with human trafficking, um, with um, the drug trade. A lot of times they all work together in the same kind of trade. And yes, some of these bad actors were in Ohio. Um, so, what happened next was, so the, the accredited zoos in Ohio, they had long been trying to clean this up in the state, but they had just not gotten anywhere in the state legislature. So then in October of 2011, a really horrible incident happened, which some of your viewers may remember. Um, in Zanesville, Ohio, one of these owners who had dozens and dozens of lions, tigers, bears, baboons, wolves, the whole menagerie, he slashed open the cages of all of these animals on his property and then he shot himself and they all got out and there were schools. This was about 4.30 in the afternoon. It was raining. There were kids on a soccer field like half a mile nearby. There were schools nearby. There were families out. The cops had to go out and shoot all of these wild oh animals. Oh my God. And um, there's a picture that was leaked from that of just in the rain, in the mud, the bodies of these animals all piled in a big pile. It's just horrific. And it, um, it made international news. It made Ohio look just terrible. And so this law, some kind of cracking down on this trade, which had long been overdue, um, came before the state legislature. Within a week, there was a law. And so I was working with the HSUS um, to help pass that law. And um, my role in that was to um, work with the sanctuary directors. So. Um, 
I have got testimony from about a dozen um, animal sanctuary directors from around the country. And many of these sanctuaries I had actually visited um, because my husband was, is a professor at University of Dayton and he had been putting together a course on human animal interactions or animals in society. He's a sociology professor. He put together a course about this. And to support that, we visited a lot of zoos and sanctuaries. So I already had um, talked to a lot of these people. So most of them submitted written testimony, but Carol Baskin from Big Cat Rescue traveled to Ohio, as did Patty Finch, who was at that time the director of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, which accredits sanctuaries. And so they testified before the legislature. I took them around to meet with several key legislators. Um, they talked about just, you know, what does it take to care for these animals, to, right. <laughs> to feed them, to provide veterinary care, to have humane enclosures that meet their needs. How much money does that cost? Which is way more than most of these owners in Ohio had. And um, we were successful at getting that law passed. Um, it has some of the highest animal welfare standards of any one of these um, sort of exotic animal welfare laws in the country. And um, we passed that in 2012 and it's a model law for the rest of the country. That's awesome. Are you aware of any other states that have passed uh, laws since that time that are similar to the one in Ohio? Um, oh, that's a good question. Most states, um, Ohio was one of the few remaining that didn't have a law, and there's still a few that don't, of which Oklahoma is one. I believe South Carolina, last I checked, was one. Um, but mm -hmm. most state laws, their standards are USDA license. And um, from the experience I saw in Ohio, that is not nearly good enough. And um, Governor Kasich, to his credit in Ohio, um, there was an attempt to have to amend the bill to um, allow USDA licensing to be the standard. And Kasich said, no, he would not sign. Well, you know, it reminds me so much of the issue with the uh, commercial breeding operations and puppy mills. Uh, the USDA standards of, you know, the four inches on either on all sides of the cages is hardly sufficient uh, to provide enrichment to those poor dogs that have to continue breeding and breeding for a hidden industry to be funneled into the pet stores. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just very, very sad. And a lot of people don't understand that about USDA. They just they assume that there's a certification process and that certification process keeps animals safe. And, and it really uh, doesn't. It um, definitely doesn't. As you, uh, what were some of the most like surprising parts of, of this uh, work that, you know, most shocking of, of the exotic animal industry? Like what were some of the, was there anything in particular that stood out to you um, as just being so, like you were just incredulous that this could even go on? Um, well, one was learning that USDA standards are, are pretty bad. And um, like, for example, with big cats, um, if you take like a U-Haul moving trailer, something that size that you pull on the back of your car, a cage that size is considered okay for a big cat, <laughs> like for a tiger or a lion. For, like, oh, for, you mean for all, all time, not just, oh, for transport, but, but for every them day. Them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's about the size of their transport cages. Um, is, according to USDA standards, that's okay for them to live in, like never to leave. And right. um, there's barely enough room to, to walk around. And also just, how little, even those standards, how little the USDA enforces. So I learned um, that, in, um, that in Ohio, there was a, an owner named Lorenza Pearson in, I think, Cockley Station was the name of the little town. He had a menagerie of tigers. Um, he was cited 969 oh. times for violations of the Welfare Act, and his animals were still not taken away. One of his tigers... Oh, my God. And that was not enough for his animals to be taken away. So eventually it was the local department of health that intervened and got the place shut down. It wasn't even the USDA that shut that place down. And so a lot of those lions and tigers ended up at a sanctuary in North Carolina that I visited. And they were the ones who told me about this. And I was just incredulous. Like, how can somebody rack up 900 violations of the USDA Animal Welfare Act and not be shut down? And right. Yeah, happened well you know the memory that always stands out to me when it comes to big cats is uh i did a uh port visit one time a few a few years ago to uh the philippines and I'll, I'll never forget it and they had one of those cub petting things and you know i was curious so i i went on it and just to see these 
baby tigers, even the, the smaller tigers, just spinning and spinning and spinning around. And it reminded me of some of the rescues or shelters that I've been to that are not uh, so, so great. And, you know, they have a name for it. I think it's called kennel crazy that they do. And when you see an animal just obsessively pacing, um, you have to wonder how, how enriching that really is for that, for that poor animal. And, uh, you know, I, I can only imagine that in an enclosure like you described that's so small that that's really not giving the animal uh, an opportunity to, to exhibit natural behaviors or, or to, be, to be an animal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so why do you think the movie Tiger King has resonated so much with people? And did that surprise you? Um, it doesn't surprise me, but from everything I've read about it, and I want to be clear, I haven't actually watched it. I cannot bring myself to watch it. <laughs> I understand. Um, but it's, it emphasizes the sensationalism of these human characters. Just off. And it does, it is often kind of, I don't want to say a crazy person, but kind of a, maybe a, um, a special person to own these animals. But one thing I learned is that most of the people who own these animals, it's a statement about them. They think they love these animals, mm -hmm. but they don't. The animals, they own these animals because they're saying, look at me and look at what I can do. It's a prop. It's about their egos. It's mm -hmm. not about the animal welfare because they couldn't keep these animals in substandard conditions and not see that it's not good welfare for them and that they can get better welfare at an accredited zoo or sanctuary. Right. Um, so a lot of these people are are pretty um, are, are pretty out there. And Joe Exotic, the in the Tiger King, is the prime example of that. So he came to Ohio and also testified during this bill. And he was in the state house hallways, waiting to get into the hearings with us and showing off his bullet hole tattoos on his chest in the state house hallway. Um, so I think people, so this series emphasizes um, these human characters who I've heard people, like people on social media call them characters. They're not characters, they're, they are actual people and mm -hmm. they are actual animals. But the series de-emphasizes the animal welfare piece. So for example, there's a scene where Joe Exotic pulls tiger cubs away from their mothers as they're just being born. Their eyes are not even open and it's not even discussed what happens to these animals? What is the fate mm -hmm. of these animals? Or right. The series had an opportunity to educate and, and to really dive into the animal welfare issues, but I feel like it chose to highlight the eccentricities of the characters in the, in the show at the expense of, of an education opportunity to say uh, what this issue is all about. And by doing that, they had to paint a good guy and they had to paint another or one bad guy against another bad guy and, and they didn't have to paint it that way yeah they, yeah they didn't have to and they also basically equate what carol baskin is doing at big cat rescue with what joe exotic is doing mm -hmm. at GW zoo it acts like they're the same and they just are not <laughs> one is an accredited um facility with excellent animal care the other one has hundreds of violations of the animal welfare act and where the owner admitted to shooting tigers in the head, which is completely illegal being an endangered species. Right. Uh, if, if not just being inhumane, um, they're just not the same. And one is also not breeding, uh, you know, tigers. One is advocating for laws to stop the breeding of tigers. One is adamantly saying that they're trying to put themselves out of business. Mm -hmm. and not continue to take in tigers or they're maybe trying to work themselves out to one day they're not being this need. Mm -hmm. So it is an absolutely unfair comparison, but I will encourage people to look at your follow-up posts too, where you explain the differences between a sanctuary and a commercial a zoo that it's not, that's not accredited. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that the public doesn't understand that. They think that because she's keeping big cats and enclosures and charging the public, they, they don't seem to understand that that's a completely different need that those sanctuaries are serving based on circuses, zoos, menageries, all these other things. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what do, I guess what I want to do now is just kind of close out with uh, what do you think 
anyone can do to average citizen. You know, you watch Tiger King, you're, you got, you know, you throw all yourself into the story, but then, you know, hopefully this is an opportunity that the public will dive like I did, dig in a little deeper and, and realize uh, that there was a lot of also untruths that, and I don't even want to call them untruths, but there were statements and there were things that were put forth by the documentary that the other side didn't have an opportunity to refute. And as a media professional, I can tell you that that's a classic trick that the media will do is they'll get one side of the story and then they don't allow the other side to refute the, the, the claim. And so people are misled. And uh, unfortunately, if you don't do the digging that I, that, you know, that I did by going on Big Cat Rescue, seeing Carol Baskin's blog, watching her husband's video recording online, um, and then seeing all the different cr accredited uh, humane organizations speaking uh, about them so favorably, they, they may still be misled. So what is it that you think, other than diving deeper online and educating yourself, what is it that you think average citizens can do now that they're aware of this issue? Right, well, the first thing is to educate yourself just as you did, which I hope that people will do after seeing the Tiger King. I kind of have my doubts that a lot of people will do, but some people will. So that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second thing is to speak up about the Big Cat Public Safety Act. So that act would basically shut down the interstate trade of big cats, which is what allows um, dealers like Joe Exotic to breed and sell these animals and sell them across state lines. And so one thing about tigers in particular is it's legal under the USDA to use them as props in, for example, photo shoots from age four weeks to 12 weeks. And then after that, it's illegal. And so what happens to all of these big cats? A lot of them are bred right. just to make money off of that. And then they have nowhere to go. So they're sold, who knows what happens to them. Um, some of them end up in, in the bushmeat trade or their skin, you know, they end up shot for money, their skins are sold, their meat are sold, and uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service cracked down on an operation like that in Operation Snowplow. Um, yep. So educating yourself about that, speaking up for the Big Cat Public Safety Act, which would put a stop to a lot of that. Um, and then the other thing um, uh, would be basically just to know where you're going. So if you're thinking about going to a place, look it up. Is it accredited? don't go to places that are not accredited. And the majority of zoos, places that call themselves zoos or sanctuaries are unfortunately not accredited. So make sure you're going to a place that's accredited by a Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries or Association of Zoo and Aquariums or even the Zoological Association um, of America, which is a third accrediting agency. Um, right, and you explained those accreditation agencies. I didn't realize that zoos had two agencies and then the sanctuaries have the one. But that was a really good explanation uh, that I will, of course, link to on this video of, of those different uh, categories so that people can make more educated um, decisions. Was the, I, 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 will, I do want to address the, the Carol husband thing, at the, and I'm just going to put my kind of my spin on that at the very end or my, my take on it. Uh, but before I do that, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, no, I think that's it. Well, I, I think that I'm just going to close out because, of course, I'm going to get lots of comments of, well, what about Carol killing her husband? Y you know what? Uh, that's for law enforcement to decide, and that is, to me, a completely separate issue. This is never going to be about Big Cat Rescue. This is not about one commercial zoo. This is about, for me, uh, misuse and mistreatment of animals. That's the bottom line. And uh, that, that is a separate issue that was brought up in the documentary for sensationalism and for views. Um, it was investigated by law enforcement. Uh, they are quoted on the record of saying that they welcome a reopening of the investigation. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm not on the inside of that information and I'm not concerned with it because it's got nothing to do with this issue. And this issue is the stopping the proliferation of the breeding of exotic animals because they are not being treated properly. They do belong in the wild and we need to end this exploitation. So Kathy, thank you so much for taking time uh, to, to join me today and to talk about this issue. I think it's incredibly important and uh, it was my way of, of 
after I heard your story, I was just so blown away at how much information you had about it and some of the ways in which you um, educated people and how well it resonated. So I hope this will also uh, lend some uh, education to the discussion. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, and I hope so too.